Hi everyone and welcome back to another lecture here in the Anthropology of Music and Sound. This week we are in week seven talking about a variety of issues that in many ways relate back to some topics we've already covered. We're talking about music and sound genres, means of listening and context of fandom, and also the issue of commercialism and music, which I think is really a repeat of some of the uh, topics we've talked about in previous weeks. As we begin the week, I think really it's worth looking at the issue of music and genre. Listed in the weekly themes for week seven, I've included all the possible genres, but there's no way that this is everything. So one of the challenges when you look up genre, you get into the issue of what exactly constitutes a genre. If we look at the etymology of genre, we see it's a particular style of art. So it's a French word that is used in English, and it refers to any kind, sort, or style. So that probably really connects with what we think of as a genre. It's a type of music that has certain char characteristics or qualities that we can lump together. We can talk this week also about whether some of those things that allow us to lump together different musical artists or bands or styles with one, in one type of genre or style is whether or not this connects to some of the issues we discuss with technology or tonality, instruments, dynamic, performance, emotion. That would be kind of interesting to talk about. For example, could you have heavy metal music that has emotion that's similar to country music? With genre blurring and fusion and hybridity of different musical forms out there, it seems to me that we can also talk about the idea that genres can sometimes break down and some bands are really hard to characterize in terms of where they fit in relative to the genre supposedly that they exist in. We can look at a few examples this week. And you will find these all located on the media site for this week or also the site for our readings. So this is one conversation about what a musical genre is. It, it tells a little bit about the origin of that word as we just discussed. You can also watch these videos that show you characterizations of the type of music that is specific to each genre. And you could see whether or not this kind of connects with your notion of what you think a genre is or whether you think the, um, the idea maybe even is outdated or challenging because a lot of bands don't necessarily fit into what we consider to be a particular musical genre. Here's another list, and this is where it gets a little more expansive and we can start to really consider the idea that a genre of music might actually be not um, identifiable or definable just because there are so many examples of bands that break through and don't really fit and so you start to question like what exactly is this style of music it's interesting for example here that they include music concrete as part of alternative I wouldn't think of it as such um, I don't even know if it would be in this uh, list of alternative genres I don't think necessarily new wave and music concrete connect but Again, everybody has their own sensibility about how to lump together musical categories or styles. Just look under all the different examples of blues. Children's music, classical. Um, I would probably put music concrete in here with avant-garde classical styles of music again. Comedy, different kinds of country music, dance, everything from EDM to hardcore quite a few examples of or genres of, of dance music electronic German folk French pop you can see this is very very extensive so if you find something that is this lengthy you definitely begin to understand that it's going to be very hard to define genres this focus on metal is very interesting. We watched a video of Harry Berger, I believe, in our class, and he was actually a student in the ethnomusicology program back when I was at Indiana University. And I recall that he was doing work in his dissertation research on trying to identify different genres of metal. And I think it's kind of interesting that you could see so many different types of metal here. Um, new Age music, pop music, and the list goes on and on and on. This is just alphabetical. So look over this list this week and see whether or not you think this A relates to what you think a genre is as a general category or definition that we could talk about this week. And B, go in and look for some of your favorite examples of music. So for me, I would want to look at prog rock. And that comes up under 
alternative. Let's see if it also comes up under rock, progressive bluegrass, um, country, progressive country, progressive house, progressive folk, progressive metal, progressive breaks. The other one that I'm curious about is so-called intelligent dance music. And they list it under drum and bass. I've heard it referred to as intelligent dance music, but they do have it under, they have it under electronic. So one of the things you might check out is go and look at some of your favorite genres and see if this kind of fits in with your typology that you have of music this week. So this is a list again from the module, just if you want to check that out and compare that to these other sources. In just a second, I'll be going on screen and doing a demo with VSTs or virtual synth instruments. But one of the curious things is you can talk about genre from that fandom perspective. What's on Spotify? What kind of music do you like? You can also look at it through music production. So websites like sounds.com, for example, start to break things into these larger genres. So anyone doing film music or cinematic, the types of sounds would be in here versus say house music versus electronic versus ensemble and so forth. I think one challenge for folks who design for music technology and software, not so much for this kind of music, but more for the computer-based music, is to really figure out how to market their VST, their synth instrument, such that it will kind of connect back to the marketing tools that are necessary to sell your product to the wider audiences out there that want to make music of various sorts. So it's kind of interesting to compare what you see in the electronic world of music and sound production genre wise versus the fandom level as we talk about Spotify and other examples. Now when you do the readings this week I'm really going to recommend that you pick from this long list of the genres I have and pick out one of these and just um, again read a chapter or a short selection. I don't expect you to read all these. Again to clarify some of the questions out there these are not intended as everything you need to read for the week, but a sampling, and then you need to go in and sort of decide what you want to check out. So check out your favorite genre, maybe, if that's the case. Click on that and see what the reading has to say and discuss that in your text post for the week. Now, these get kind of cool. I really like and recommend you check out some of these, these genre databases, because we can really use the interactive abilities of the Internet and multimedia to get a sense of what genres are like. So this particular one here is pretty cool. This is from Google, I believe. And it talks about the different genres. And what's cool is you can go in here and look at a data set. And let's just go look at ska, perhaps, which I don't know a lot about. Some of you probably know more than I do. It looks like we have various um, videos, I guess, that are listed here. It talks about the musical genre and I'm not sure what the data set parts are. It looks like they are, to me they look like videos. Again, I'm not familiar with this particular site. We can check out Christian music, 3,100 different annotations. Let's hope you play this, what happens. It just goes to YouTube. So this would be interesting to see how they decide on which artist to pick for this data set. I'd be kind of curious about that just to try to understand how they come up with their data set. Evaluation videos. Okay, these are all the videos they have selected. This, I guess you can read the um, discussion here of how they create these data sets for this particular tool. Maybe if I click on the ontology project. Okay, this is interesting. The audio set ontology is a collection of sound events organized in a hierarchy. It's a wide range of everyday sounds, humans and animals to natural and environmental sounds, musical and miscellaneous sound. Each ontology entry contains a basic description of the sound event from Wikipedia, WordNet, or written by us. It's meant to be expandable to meet the research needs of the academic community. There's also a GitHub page where a GitHub page where you can download, I guess, um, maybe the code, I don't know, related to this. So kind of interesting, you can get into the sounds of things. They're categorized here. And it looks like 128,000 annotations. So these are really big data sets. And then these are specific to, it looks like types of sounds, wax, smashes, 
bounces, knocks, taps, thumps, thuds. Very interesting. I'm assuming a lot of these are not royalty free or public domain, but there are sounds out there. If you're interested in free sounds that do um, have royalty free uses, go to freesound.org. It's one word and you'll be able to really find a lot of great sources here. I think they ask you to sign up for things, but I've used this a lot. It's kind of graphically not fancy, but it's very easy to use and you can find a lot of great information there. So again, check out this Google project. I think it's very interesting. This next one is very graphical. It's the Music Map Web, and I came across this and thought it was very cool to look at music and ask some questions about what a genre is and how we understand genres. What I like about this is it's a visualization. And so you have all the genres listed here and then you can dive in and really try to understand a particular type of music. So maybe we'll take blues, click on that. It has a very long description. Again, this is really well done. And then you get into one of these charts that is really interesting to look at because it allows you to dive in and explore more deeply specific types of genres and relationships. So this is fusion versus soul, soul jazz, jazz funk. And what I think they're trying to do here is trace relationships. And I'm a really big fan of information design where you can do this kinds of uh, charting of connections. So I'd be curious to read a little bit more here. And this is the first time that I've I've encountered this. Okay, here here is how they're doing this. This is very slick actually. So if it's a primary origin or derivative, it's a solid line. Secondary is dashed line. Anti-influence is another type of line. Various influences or derivatives is a dotted line. And then this kind of shows you the timeline and you can choose as overlays, the time reference, background, musical worlds, music groups, constellation mode, which is interesting. Maybe these are things you could click on. Um, just looking at this, this music map is definitely a major work as, as you can see. And this talks about how they define the genre here. So this is probably actually going to be really good. I recommend that you look at this definition of genre because they've spent a lot of time obviously mapping this literally and figuratively. Here's an introduction that talks about it. Just looking through all these legends and layers, the super genres. So you can see the colors and then the super genres help you define what's within sort of in these subgenres. So they've really taken a lot of time identifying this and trying to figure out a way of mapping it. Um, there's a glossary here as well, acknowledgments and about. So this I hope can be really a primary focus of our conversations this week because I just feel like it's really super intensive, extensive as far as how they've mapped out genres in this um, chart sense using information design. So definitely check out that media for this week. Now we can also talk about genre fusions and I think this gets kind of interesting because it suggests to us that maybe the category of genre, not unlike let's say the category of culture in anthropology might be outdated and maybe we need to move beyond genre. So this talks about different albums that be, could be considered genre fusion. So if you like, you could just click on any of these, listen to the bands. I'm not going to play them now because of the YouTube algorithms, but it'd be interesting to think that these are bands that maybe are defying the idea that there are specific genres out there or that you can't possibly combine them. Um, Limp Biscuit, it seems to me, you know, it's like, is it genre defining or is it fusing um, metal music and rap and the whole rage rock movement, which is, I think, gone a little out of style, but uh, was a big deal, of course, going back to the Woodstock controversies. Tool is very interesting because Tool, I think, has a lot of characteristics of metal and alternative, but when you get into the complexity of the songwriting, the drumming, um, just the musicianship, it really connects more to what we would consider as a dream theater and like progressive metal, but even that doesn't do justice because I think a lot of Tool is falling outside of specific categories that we might think of, whether it's metal, alternative, um, 
progressive rock or whatever. I don't know a lot of these, but I'll invite you to look at these and see what you think. It's a pretty extensive list. If you like any of these bands, you could certainly post about them and um, offer your takes on things. The other thing to think about within this, I think, is when bands start to shift. I'm thinking of when Metallica went from, you know, like Master of Puppets to their Black Album, where, you know, literally people said, and figuratively, that they you know, shaved and cut their hair off and did something maybe that was more palatable to a mainstream audience. Same thing happened with Green Day. You know, they release an album that has maybe a string quartet on it and people say, well, they've sold out. Have they sold out or have they changed? And I think that's one thing to look at when you talk about these types of bands that maybe go through changes. It's not so much a blurring of genre. Here's Master of Puppets, but it might be more an experimentation with moving in some new directions. So some things to consider there, maybe as we break down the concept of genre and talk about it in senses beyond the, the idea of pure categories. So another interesting topic to talk about this week is how genre emerges from our sound production devices and technologies themselves. So in this case, I'll be looking at some virtual synths. We call these VSTs. And VSTs are computer versions of synthesizers, of sam sampled instruments, and indeed, once you start to work through the lists of different genres or styles and approaches inside of some of these virtual synths, you also see this reflection of what we've been talking about today in terms of the idea of, of genres being created out of our musical and listening preferences. So in the old days, before we had VSTs, we had synthesizers and samplers that maybe gave you a choice of a few sounds. It might have been 10, 20, or maybe 100 sounds. Now, literally, if I take an instrument like this instrument called Massive, which gets a lot of play and use by people doing EDM and dubstep, hip-hop music, a lot of electronic dance ambient styles of music, and it's an incredible synthesizer, not just because of all the sounds available, but because of all the parameters that you can control at any given time. Like a lot of other virtual synths, you have presets. And I think what's pretty interesting is when you start to dive into these presets, if you just look at the sounds themselves, something like altered states, my guess is it'll be a funky sounding pad of some sort. You're hearing a lot of complexity to these sounds. Again, these are all pre-made, but to go back to our theme of commercialism we've been talking about, you can easily go in and adjust any of the parameters so I can adjust the frequency, the different waveforms being used. And so there's a lot of customization that you can take to any of the sounds. But I think what's interesting specific to this week is how everything can be arranged via different types of sounds or instruments. And some of these might, in fact, uh, connect to ideas of genre. So if you click on something like an organ, you get different styles of organs. Same thing with guitars, bowed strings, and so forth. And if I click all types, I get many more. And over time, as you start to play through different sounds, you can start to associate these with genres. Just adjusting the noise parameter. One of the things that's amazing, if you know synth design is, it's pretty crazy all the power you can get in one synthesizer. And I was talking with a friend, a filmmaker friend, and we're doing some collaborations lately. And I was saying, you know, like what you can do with a virtual synth, just because you can literally have a sound that is a gigabyte or more as far as the sample library, as far as the customization you can do, as far as just the variety of sounds. Part of me, though, misses playing with my other synths because I feel like it's a totally different, more generative process there. In some ways, much more creative. To make a sound like this right here, which is 
really phenomenal and amazing and just an amazing, interesting sound. But to do that with my Eurorack gear, it's going to take me half an hour, 45 minutes or something like that to get to that level to customize it and make it sound like that. And of course, starting with things, I don't often go into it thinking I want something that sounds like that drum loop. But totally amazing when, when you think about just what is available with virtual synths. But the thing I wanted to mention too is when you start to explore again, you might have specific uh, sets. One of these actually is an EDM set. I'm forgetting which one it actually is. One is a ambient set. That's literally a sound I would never use in my music, but that's okay. I can find one I would use. When you hear that wide, like, pulse width modulation, I start to think of genres right there. I think of, like, big ambient house, trance, probably, style music, something you'd hear in a big club. And, um, you know, so certain sounds start to get associated with genres, and I think that's the interesting side of connecting what we're talking about with the actual musical genres and some of those lists we looked at earlier, and now getting into the levels of sound. So beyond Massive, we can look at other examples and this is a whole set of virtual synths I, I have through a program called Contact. This is all made by a company called Native Instruments out of Berlin. I really like the production quality of what they've done. Um, the instruments can get expensive but you can buy production packs and then a lot of these are by other companies but they make it in this native format called Contact. So just looking through this list here you'll begin to see genres sort of being indicated by the style of music. Um, you can just tell by, by looking at some of these. Analog Dreams is an example of this where we're going to get uh, very lush analog instruments. And some of these, you can probably tell by the stylistics of this, but some of these actually are influenced by the soundtrack, say, of uh, Stranger Things on Netflix, which is a very famous series that I think got a lot of interest because of how it has this very retro feel, throwback feel, in terms of the themes that are brought up, references to other 80s shows and iconic memes of the 80s and also some of the sounds and if you look deeply into the soundtrack design for Stranger Things there's a real sensibility there in terms of the production and trying to bring out some of these retro sounds and this is an example then of kind of riffing off of that it's not a genre per se but it's a mood or a particular style so you can play with these instruments and have something that sounds somewhat like Stranger Things you have artists uh, like Nils Fram, incredible electronic musician, and people have created pianos just based on his style of musical play. So the other thing that's interesting is it, we're not just thinking of something that's genre influenced, but musician influenced. So a musician like Nils Fram can influence the creation of a very specific virtual synth that is in fact sampled from his actual instruments, his customized special pianos that he has had built for him. You also get into different genres of world music. So we have Middle Eastern instruments and very typically you'll have things that include percussion and that also have like different wind instruments depending on the genre of music or the style. And What's happening in here, you can't see the keyboard I'm playing, but every key has a different sound trigger. And in this case, we're playing loops. And what's pretty crazy is you can go in and adjust the mixing parameters. If there's different drums, you can decide where those are. You can do custom key splits, and a key split basically refers to where different sounds are played on a keyboard. This is something that, you know, obviously in the old days of pianos and organs, although organs actually are an example of key splits because when you play an organ, not only can you customize um, the different pipes that you're playing, but you can create registers, you can create brass sounds on different 
uh, manuals, different octaves of the keyboard that you're playing. But key splitting in synthesizers really allows you to customize the keyboard so you can have all your low sounds playing down here, or patterns, have your fills playing in this area. And you see the fill will choke the previous loop. When I release it, the loop comes back. So it's almost taking a page out of the old uh, synthesizers I remember. They, these were more like consumer keyboards that were around in the 70s and they had a lot of preset rhythms. He would hold down uh, certain, you know, the lower octave and that would play a bass line. You had walking basses on old organs. I remember growing up playing on an organ, first learning keyboards, and all that kind of preset stuff was happening then. So when we talk about the commercialization effect on music today, it's actually been with us for a very long time. But just today, it's more immediate because we can play with instruments like this virtual Middle Eastern instrument. You also have very specific sounds that are customized for almost like genres, not of music, but even of film. There's a lot of people nowadays, myself included, using virtual instruments to create soundtracks or sound effects for films. So this is an example of a library I would only use in film scoring really for a very dark horror type film. And what's very amazing is you can go in and modulate so many parameters on here. I could actually take any of these parameters on here, whether it's effects or this modulation matrix, and map it to particular MIDI commands, which means I can turn a knob on a keyboard and then I can adjust that in real time. I, so I can also record that into my VST and customize the modulation so that I have a sound that evolves over time like, like we're looking at here. When you get into things like the color of a sound or the tone, it almost reminds me a little bit of um, Instagram camera filters where you go on there and you talk about the warmth and there's certain like almost color grading parameters that have become part and parcel of some of the online sharing of photography. And so that's another interesting issue too. It's outside of our area of sound and music, but people have been very concerned about the effect of commercialization and say filters on the whole art of photography and filmmaking because people are concerned that you'll use that to sort of customize your own work but in a way maybe that doesn't involve a deep creative dive on your own part. Now this one's quite interesting. This is Bernard Herrmann. Bernard Herrmann is the amazing composer who did so many of the scores for great films, Citizen Kane, um, all, you know, not all but a huge number of Hitchcock films. So a very specific style, and if you look into the work of Bernard Herrmann, he had a way of miking his orchestra that gave it this presence, this sense of immediacy. And one of the cool things you can do with virtual instruments these days is go in and adjust mic positions, which dramatically changes the music and which really illustrates how crazy the technology is. In the old days, if I played a string sound on my old Roland sampling keyboard that was maybe, I don't know how many kilohertz, maybe 24 kilohertz, it was really bad quality. It was one string patch, it wasn't multi-sampled. When we multi-sample something, we take it and we assure that every key that we play on our keyboard as we're playing the sound will trigger a sample of that exact instrument that has been recorded. So that's like one level of multi-sampling and you get into not just having one sample, but tens of thousands of samples because you have different articulations. If you're talking about a string instrument, the difference between a marcato, a sustained legato tone, um, something that's a pizzicato, something that's a tremolo or a Bartok type sound, a plucky kind of more avant-garde type sound is requiring then that you have to have all of those various articulations as you see here, the difference between a long string and a pizzicato or a short. Actually, I just realized that it might be instructive. I just set a, a camera up here so you can actually watch the notes that I'm playing as I'm playing them here on the virtual instrument. So this kind of gets into this issue of automation. We've been talking about commercialization where I'm playing one note, I play a D and it plays, I don't know the exact chord that's being played there. But you can create some incredible mood. And I can go in and customize the release 
the amount of reverb so I can have it a, have a long release. And again, this isn't anything different than on traditional analog synthesizers. If I um, look at my ARP clone, the Behringer clone of the 2600, I have an ADSR, a tactic a sustained release ability to control the envelope of the sound and so forth. So it's nothing different, but what does get different is this level of being able to customize things and also automate things. I can adjust the closeness. And as I'm doing that, you see the computer is processing. And then if I click on this, and it's a pretty dramatic effect, bringing them closer again, that's really that Bernard Herrmann style. The sense of presence that the strings are really near you versus far away. It's a pretty dramatic effect, so you can again use this in such a way that the customi customization potentials are almost limitless. And that's one of the things I think that is amazing about VSTs. And the cool thing too is, even though this is, this is very specialized, I think for someone who enjoyed all those amazing soundtracks of Bernard Herrmann and Hitchcock films and so forth, can really think about starting from a place of commonality, you like that style, this orchestra is designed in reference to that style, but it's not like the notes are composed for you. So that being said, one of the interesting things and maybe concerning things for us is the fact there are virtual instruments that really, I think, do promote a level of not necessarily doing a lot of work on your own. And we'll get into this conversation when I show you this uh, loop engine called Arcade. So this is from the very famous um, keyboardist, singer, George Duke. And what I find strange about this one is there is no instrument that you're playing. There is an Alicia Keys piano that is just a sample piano and it's quite beautiful. This one is actually many loops that George Duke has played and then has been recorded into this instrument. So I'll show you what this is like. And so it's just, for me, not very useful as an instrument because I'm literally just triggering something that someone else has played. Now granted, I can go in and adjust some of the effects. I can go to different types of sound, clean versus more distorted tube type sound. Um, but I just find that very strange, say compared to something like a virtual gamelan that I can play all the tones myself. And that is, you know, more, there's more opportunity for me to work with that and actually do something creative as opposed to playing someone else's pre-made sounds. This thing, same thing can be said of something like action strings. So you can go in and choose specific rhythms. There's an entire menu that you choose from that allows you to go in and customize um, the type of sound you want and as you play it. And it's really super well done. And again, what I probably could do with this is use this for a dramatic moment in a score or something like that and build on top of it. So in other words, I could just record this as a bit of a loop and then add other elements on top of it. And then in that way, it seems a little more generative and creative and from the ground up as opposed to just having something that's a pure loop. That being said, sometimes I think we enjoy the fact that you know, like if we're not a great guitarist or something, we can have a virtual instrument like Heaviosity scoring guitars and have a loop to work with. And the other thing that's, that's really amazing about VSTs these days is that everything is recorded in the most pristine sound studios. I have one VST I'll talk about later called Symphonic Destruction that's recorded in uh, at Skywalker Ranch, the famous um, Star Wars soundstage. And it's just absolutely amazing in terms of the level of quality. You again have also sort of vintage sounds, so Abbey Road 50s style. What I like about these is when you play one drum kit, if you play the 50s drum kit,
it really does sound more vintage as opposed to if you try the style of the 80s much different style drum kit And so I think one of the cool things about virtual instruments is that ability to focus on a particular era of an instrument or of a style of music as we've been talking about a genre. And there's also the ability to take music in new directions. This is a kinetic metal um, sound engine. It reminds me actually of, if you know, Little People. It kind of makes me think of, of some of his music. And you can go in and adjust the flow of everything and the style of the metals being played. And you can turn the motion on here, which gets kind of cool. So you're hearing, if you're listening in headphones, you can hear just the sound moving in your headphone space. So one of the things that virtual instruments encourage us to do is also to explore the creativity of sound and its spatial components as it's moving around in our headphones, in our sonic space, and so forth. So I think, you know, there's always a mixed bag when you talk about anything, and the same can be applied to video production, to those of you involved in the visual arts and photography, where you can sometimes take some shortcuts, but if you're trying to minimize maybe the time you spend on something that's very dull, and not exciting to you, then I think it's uh, well worth having some of those so-called shortcuts, as we'll talk about this week later with AI music and how AI is, is transforming a lot of what we're doing in the world of sound design, in the world of mixing, and so forth. Now let me show you one um, sound design tool that I've never used and I don't think I ever will use. It's called Voices of Rage. And this, I believe, is geared at heavy metal music and this is so classic kind of in terms of you know the idea of a genre and maybe the idea of a genre stereotype so this is what this instrument does My time So the idea behind this is, um, I guess you could write your own heavy metal song and you could use these as vocals. For the moment, you called your own, your way, your way, waiting for, I'm feeling the way, say you me. I just sell to divide no excuse the whole it takes me Wow <laughs> I don't know I have no reaction to that um, so I guess the idea behind this is is you could combine you know like spoken words and phrases and this one I think allows you to go in and do actual words no. I so just make sure if you write this song, it has the words no, nothing, and pain in it. My, my night, nothing, pain, please. Oh man, um, that's my reaction to this. I wasn't expecting these words.
Now I'm thinking I might actually have to create something with this because I'm almost speechless just listening to this, right? And I think this is maybe driving home the point I'm trying to make. So this is an example. I'd be curious to go online. I should look at who's used Voices of Rage. And I have to say, when I bought the Sound Iron Bundle, it was a really good deal. I wanted some of their choirs and also their drum machines. This one came along with the bundle. I would never in a million years purchase Voices of Rage. But um, again, maybe there's a use for this this instrument. So I'll have to try that in a track someday. Um, be on the lookout for that or not, maybe. Um, so VSTs, again, I think really can encourage us to be super creative or they can also maybe encourage us to do something that is just a little too automated. I wanted to show you this symphonic destruction and I've been working with this because this has been specifically influenced by a lot of the big sound design of say movies like Interstellar, there's this idea of a bram, which is sort of an onomatopoeia. It sounds like a big brass sound, so it's like bram, like when you when you hear it in a movie. So this specific instrument is created so that you could possibly create your own sonic cues for movies and so forth. And what's pretty interesting about this is you can turn on the motion of the instrument and so it allows you to really create um, movement in your sound which I think can get pretty um, interesting just from a perspective of having things move around. Let's see if this is going to work. I have to turn on these various elements and then I think it will work. Sort of getting some movement, but in, in most cases... Oh, there we go. So again, you can hear that in your headphones. So it, it's taking advantage of maybe some of the interests of people to experiment more with sonic design, but they don't want to have to spend a ton of time to create automated modulation. To do this, just like you have to do, say, keyframes in doing video production, you have to go in in a program like Logic and you have to create various curves. So you can create velocity curves, you can create time signature, tempo curves, and a lot of this you can draw. You can customize the parameters and then it allows you to go in and say create panning effects, but you have to do all this manually. So I think a lot of people don't want to spend that amount of time, so therefore they, they go to an instrument like Symphonic Destruction to maybe make things a little easier to work with. Now we can also look at an instrument like Omnisphere by Spectrosonics, and this instrument is created by Eric Pershing. The company is created by Eric Pershing, who used to work as a sound engineer for Roland years ago. Incredibly amazing sonic design. I often tell people if you're buying one VST that has a range of instruments and colors and a lot of experimental stuff thrown in, it's definitely Spectrosonic's Omnisphere. What's interesting is when you start to look into the attributes of the sounds, you can start to match sounds together. So I can choose one and then try to match it to another sound. Or I can go into the attributes menu and look at categories of sound, type of sounds, and these get into kind of genre-based decisions or qualities. So something that's a bell versus something atonal. And then we can actually get into genres and then the author. So getting at the genres as an example, we start to see replication of what we've been looking at this week on those other genre lists. Something that is work, world music versus rock versus hip hop versus indie. The EDM is one that I've seen a lot of and or dubstep. So again, you click on that and then you'll get the sound. And then that sound reflects that specific genre. And one of the thing that that dubstep or EDM is known for is really taking advantage of a lot of electronic, experimental, and often very harsh sounding timbres of instruments and using those to create a very distinctive style. So it's an example of how a genre can very closely live in connection with, say, the sonic qualities of, of something. And it reminds me a little bit 
going back to this qualities of sound and music where we can start to associate now genres and specific timbral or electronic or technological elements together. And I think that makes for a very interesting conversation when we start thinking about how this has evolved over time. Beyond this, you know, there is an effort, at least in something like Spectrosonics, to give us very experimental sounding instruments. And what I like about their approach is they often will use different types of world synths or instruments like this bottle cap in Bira. And they'll do something unique with the instrument. Like they'll hit it with toothpicks. And it just makes for really interesting sounds. A coffee can kalimba. So it's kind of unique and interesting, and actually if you're hearing this, you can tell that this is really creating through the sampling technology very spot-on, high-fidelity instruments and altering them up a bit by doing different things in terms of how you play those instruments, how the instruments are affected by maybe bits of metal or wood or whatever has been applied to the instrument or used, say, to surround it to create an acoustic resonance effect of some sort. So I think as much as sometimes VST designers feel like they have to focus on these genres, these categories of music that almost seem universal, they're also allowing us to experiment and look at some new approaches. And then we can always, as we've been talking about today, take any of these instruments and modify them with all the parameters here where I can adjust um, an LFO, which is um, a wave that is oscillating or affecting the sound that I'm playing. And so that itself really allows me, I don't know if we can hear it in this example, but not so much, but it, it just really allows me to do a lot of customization and maybe makes me feel like I'm not so locked into the automatic parameters that have been set up for me by the instrument designers. Now, one other one to, to maybe close on here is an instrument called Arcade. This is a specific instrument that uses really only loops, although they've added recently the ability for you to actually play actual sounds, which sounds kind of funny. So this is set up more almost using kind of the world of social media. It feels very social media -y to me, um, if, if that's a word. So you have a feed, you have a search, you have different lines you can choose, and these lines are all based on genres or types of sound. So if you wanted something like that other sound library I mentioned that was called Thrill, this one's called Nightmare. And you can choose any of these ahead of time as a preview. If I like that, I download what they call a kit, so not unlike a drum kit. And then you'll see as this comes up, once I load this up, it's laid out all on really one or two octaves, these are all modulation keys. So all the black keys will modulate a particular sound. And I can actually use one of these key dogs. I use these all the time for recording. They're actual just um, pieces of metal that allow you to latch a key. So if I like an A here, I'll hold down my A. And it should continue to play. And then I can modulate that with one of these modulation modifier keys. Here we go. So I think that's doing a, a loop. Not the easiest to hear on some of these. You can try a different key. These are not that great. So you get a sense of that. So it's almost laid out more like a DJ style. When I think of DJing, I have no experience in, in doing, you know, turntable DJ kind of work. But you can also adjust the key. 
so you can have it fit in to whatever key you happen to be playing in. And then you can go in and adjust these parameters, which are not traditional music parameters like we saw with the Bernard Herman Orchestra, where we're doing things like adjusting the attack, the release, the sustain, the decay. We're hearing things or reading things like Chopper, Destroyer, Warper, and Smear. And those are pretty, again, pretty impressive sounds. So a lot of work, obviously, in talent and technology has gone into creating something like this instrument. But what's very unique to me about something like Arcade is how it's really based on loops and how this genre perspective that we've been talking about really comes to sort of full fruition here. Where if we want 80s style music, we can play some of this and choose our 80s style music. Um, hip hop beats in the instrument called drip. If we like the 60s, we can go to our 60s page. If we want orchestral, we go to overture. So this in a sense, I think is suggesting to us that we've come full circle now and we really maybe are becoming too reliant on some of these technologies and again, these genre assumptions or sort of archetypes that we've created through our own fandom, listening and own musical and sonic practices realizing something like like all of that in, in this particular instrument. Now, that being said, you can actually go in here and play um, what they saw, what they call sampler kits. I think this is an example of it. And then as we saw before, we can go in and adjust the parameters of the sounds. And you can get a really wide range using this vinyl simulator. And again, you can modulate all this. And so I don't know what you think of that, but at least, you know, in this case, you can play the entire keyboard. You're not just playing loops. But when you get into these instruments that are really focused only on loops, I think the question becomes like, how do you um, consider this in terms of it being a musical or sonic device? Now, the other side of it is it could open up more musical and sonic opportunities to people that don't play or read music or have a lot of experience in performance, and they can actually create some interesting sounds using these, these presets. I don't see anything wrong with that. I think there's a certain level of elitism that maybe we have when we sometimes say we shouldn't allow people to have this level of preset, non-customizable content that's almost created for you ahead of time. So one of the things that I think is kind of cool about this is I can use it sometimes if I'm just trying to do something real quick and I want to make, say, a musical bed for one of the videos I'm working on, I can just go to one of these preset um, instruments. I could sample it. Yeah, I'm not, none of these are speaking to me. <laughs> okay, let's use that one. I don't know if I, I like any of these actually. <laughs> Maybe I'm partially proving my point here that because you can't customize it, you're really stuck kind of with whatever mood or genre they're trying to create. Let's try to find a drum sound. So I can have my kick drum playing. Throw in a go-go, or whatever that is. It sounds like an a go-go. And then maybe some bass line or something. I'm missing my third key dog, but you get the idea. So what I like about that is if I'm just doing a music bed, as I said earlier, I don't have to spend a lot of time because to be quite honest with you, if I make a training video and I put 
an intro song. I just want a, to create a mood and throw that with my title. And then I do that for an outro as well. I don't necessarily want to spend a half an hour, an hour to write a song from scratch using my other instruments. So actually having this library with output arcade, I feel like allows me to save, to save some time sometimes if I don't want to get in and actually compose something from scratch. So I don't know what you think about that, but again, I think it's an opportunity to use these instruments as we look at them to try to understand some of the challenges of commercialization, that sort of flux between or that movement between something you do 100% on your own from scratch versus something that is created for you and you're just doing a few things, literally in some cases holding down three keys and then recording that song to disc and you know sharing it with the world. So stuff for us to think about for sure this week. Now, one of the things I think is kind of interesting here is my own experiences that I've been involved in working on trying to submit my music on Spotify, on iTunes, and some other sites. And if you go to Spotify, talk about this later with a royalty est estimator for Spotify, but um, just open up the web player here. I do not get a lot of plays on Spotify, but what you can do is search and here is my artist page I don't know if it'll list my tracks it looks like it's listing all my tracks here I have all of two monthly listeners so as you can see I'm definitely not in the big um, Spotify plays out there but what's interesting is if you want your music to play on a lot of these sites and my music is up on most of the sites Apple Music Store or Google Music Spotify, Pandora, is you have to really do a lot of work on the back end to get your music up and running. That involves everything from creating your track art, which I create on Canva, to making sure your track is mastered correctly, so I do that ahead of time. The music side of thing is one side of it, but what really takes a long time is like the data side of things. And this, I think, starts to speak, not just to the issue of genre, and that's a, a side of why I have this included, but to the issue of how music itself is becoming more of like, I'm not entirely sure how to express this, but like a data set or a collection of data. I was watching a thing with Bill Maher and little Stevie, the famous musician from the E Street Band, and Bill Maher made the statement that in one year on Spotify, the number of artists that existed were 1.6 million. And he was saying to little Stevie, like, isn't this an indication that there's too much music and there's a lot of bad music? I don't think it's that so much. I think it's the indication of we're moving more towards open source culture and the opportunity for everyday people to submit their tracks like I do to the music services. You can use a site like Sound Exchange. One of the things that gets very interesting is when you get to this data set here. And what you have to do is really create your own spreadsheet. And once you have that spreadsheet up, you have to have everything from your song title, the length of the song, anything that relates to an album that it might exist on, the duration of the song, the recording date, the rights, whether worldwide or specific to a country, and then um, the ISRC, which is a unique code like an ISBN with a book or a magazine or a UPC code that is unique to your track only. And that itself I found was really challenging to get set up. I read a lot of tutorials. I eventually created all these and had to pay a little bit for these different services. But one of the most curious things is this genre label here, this uh, metadata that tells the site that you're loading it to what type of music it is, and then when it plays on services like Spotify and other services, then that genre gets part of that playlist. That genre becomes part of the way that the algorithms within the Play website defines exactly what the music is, when it gets played, the people that might be interested in it, and that whole system. So this is, is quite interesting because it suggests to us that there's something about music from the beginning prior to submitting your tracks that really defines what your music is or what it isn't and again this goes back to this category that we've been talking about this week of genre. I'm not going to get uh, too much in the weeds in terms of talking about how to submit your music. Um, if you're ever interested in that we can certainly talk offline but the one thing about this process that I really thought of was this concept of genre and how it connects to our discussion this week. The other thing I think it connects to as we talk about Spotify and maybe critique and both support, say, some of these new systems is how it does give independent artists an opportunity 
to submit their music to the world. Now, does it actually get played, as we'll talk about with the Spotify revenue estimator later? Maybe not, but it sure is interesting to see that you can actually submit your music to the rest of the world and other people can listen to it. And of course, a lot of you out there might be more interested in a site like Bandcamp. And Bandcamp, I think, is even more independent because you don't have to do ISRC codes. You can if you want. You can do whatever you want with your tracks as far as your art. And it's more of a community peer-based system, as I'll talk about later with YouTube, and some of my experiences with my own musical communities, then it is one that is focused on commercialism when you think about Spotify. I put a lot of music up here, including some old experimental music tracks I did ages ago. Um, this is actually some of the sheet music for that particular track back from the 80s. And this was an experimental uh, piece for electronic music and baritone saxophone. So one of the things I like about using Bandcamp is I could put just about anything up here and there might be an audience for it. People might listen to it. And I've made a little bit of royalties on this. Not a lot of money, but, you know, a few hundred dollars here and there, which is is kind of cool and an extra. And it kind of identifies maybe that you can have a community. And again, if you click on the community tab, it allows you to see the people who might be interested. And you can also do posts and so forth. It'll tell the uh, listeners out there that you have a new piece that has come out and you can write about it and so forth. I'm not super active on this, but you can see there are some supporters here, some people that have supported this in the past, and I do appreciate that. But it's again, not like my career or anything like that. So a lot of it, I think, a lot of it, you know, relates to doing this for fun. But it is cool to think about how independent artists and unknown people who want to do music of various sorts, regardless of genre, can take advantage of these services online. As I said, though, I think a lot of this really relates to data. When you get into all the numbers that you have to come up with, it gets uh, pretty complicated. And you spend a lot of time getting your work online by doing all this data kind of stuff. And you have to know a little bit about Excel if you really want to get good at this, because you definitely need to have this in a spreadsheet format. Once you set up your ISRC codes, you don't want to change those, because the whole point is they're permanent numbers that identify your work. And then if your work gets played, there are trackers online that can then generate royalties for you. As we'll see with the Spotify estimator, you're not going to make a lot of money doing the kind of stuff I'm doing, but for big artists, they make, of course, millions per year. And this is an example of my music playing on Modular Station. And in order to get my tracks to play on Modular Station, I had to create all these codes, send the artwork, send the music files. It was a, a pretty large undertaking, certainly, for what money I might get back in revenues, which is fairly minimal. Now, another side of commercialism I believe we could talk about this week is kind of referenced it in the Metallica and Green Day examples. You know, the phrase you hear sometimes, I like the band before they got popular. So whatever band that is. And one of the things I encourage you to do this week as we talk about commercialism is take one of your favorite bands. And if you feel like your favorite band jumped the shark or sold out or whatever phrase you want to use, talk about that in your discussion post. This would be really good for our open discussions. So you could say, you know, the band Green Day, when they did this, I really feel like they jumped the shark or they sold out because. And then this will get us into kind of combining that issue of genre and your expectation as a fan of a particular artist and how it connects back to commercialism, which is another key theme for us this week. Specific to commercialism, if you look at the article I have in our readings on Rebecca Black, part of that ARC music studio that uh, Rebecca Black's parents, when she was, I think, 13, paid $4,000 for this L.A. production house to create this video and song. And um, a lot of interesting discussion about this video. One of the things that's curious about it is how sort of stereotypical it is in terms of relating a um, teen or tween experience how the video itself is kind of formulaic, the song structure is as well. And then Rebecca Black herself singing with autotune. And if you s study the uh, pitches that she's singing, it's, it's all within less than an octave, like maybe half an octave. There's not a lot of variation there in terms of her pitch and what you know she's singing. She's not doing a Whitney Houston or Mariah Carey kind of thing in terms of multiple octaves. Um, or someone singing the Star Spangled Banner, which is, as you know, one of the most difficult vocal songs out there in the English language. So I included this because I really feel like there's this side of capitalism, the forum structure of the music and the music videos with the Rebecca Black Friday video, which was so big back years ago. And this article is talking about how it accidentally shaped 
some of the genres out there of pop music, vocal pop music, maybe even Taylor Swift, and how it came to influence a lot of our pop culture because of this certain form structure and the viral nature of it and how that going viral impacted um, a lot of artists out there maybe who thought this is something I could pick up on and use in my own work to sell music videos or whatever. Now, this uh, focus on commercialism and music performance and technology is is very interesting. So I encourage you to look at the article this week, 10 Famous Singers That Lip Sync. And this whole issue of how technology is used in a performance setting, maybe to standardize what we hear. And the reason for that standardization is maybe we have an expectation. We go to a concert and the artist is going to sound a particular way, just like they do on the album. We get to the concert and they don't. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, we can't sell concert tickets anymore. So one way to reduce that anxiety or difference or gap that happens between what you hear listening to the artist and what you hear in a live performance is to make that live performance more like the recorded performance. So you get into loops, you get into full tracks that are played and the singer sings along with. There's really sophisticated synchronization technology out there, not unlike time code that happens with um, video production where you can sync different playback tracks perfectly with your MIDI setup, with your singers, with your live instrumentalists. And it's really quite amazing because there I saw one of these for a David Bowie tribute act where they had two of these setups and they had so many sounds from the album that people expected because David Bowie's albums were incredibly complex in terms of all the different instruments you know, a lot of acoustic instruments, electronics, sounds of, of all sorts. And so if people expect to hear those iconic sounds on particular tracks, then all of a sudden, when you perform it, you say, well, we got to have those. You, one way of doing that is you could have a bunch of keyboards and people sampling those various sounds. Another way is to actually record those ahead of time and then sync that digitally with all of your live musicians, which seems like a good compromise maybe between the live impromptu stuff and the studio very rigorous and almost standardized and predictable stuff. So this is another angle we can explore, I think, this week is performances and the expectations we have when our favorite artists are performing for us and maybe we expect them to sound just like on the album. I've mentioned before the whole thing with Bob Dylan and his you know, vocal tracks versus how he sounds on stage. So I'd be very curious to hear what you have to say about this. The other side of it, I say the alternative is to say you want to avoid your performance disaster in a live performance. And one way to do that is to use technology. The argument against that is if you use too much technology, what you're hearing on stage doesn't have that spontaneity and impromptu nature that many of us enjoy in hearing live performances. So I think it's a very interesting issue. And again, we're going to come down on, on different sides of, of uh, the debate here, but it's something we certainly should talk about. Now, if we want to look at more getting into fandom, kind of connecting back a little bit to genre, we can look at some of these websites. These are all on our media site, media page for the week. This is looking at musical trends from the last year, and I believe you can go back to other years as well, talking about, say, how Black Lives Matter connects to music platforms. Spotify growth, talking about some trends there. YouTube growth, Pandora. So again, all the big services, Shazam, TikTok. And uh, this is going to get into a lot of the connections of music to social media specifically. Uh, pronoun distributions. Um, so the, again, the big data movement of music, talking about this week as I related back to sound exchange and getting my own tracks up online, this is another side of this. Again, a lot of people who are doing work in marketing, in pop culture, are not just looking at information that is created, say a song that's created or a music video. They're looking at how that information exists as one point or multiple points, tens of thousands of points of data. So we can just look at pronoun distribution on, on streaming charts to see if you know any differences in pronouns that people are using might impact, here we go, genres. So you can look at a specific genre and see whether or not in dance and electronic pronoun distribution has any difference here. Maybe under indie you would have more, a little bit more. So yeah, so that kind of suggests that there is a wider range of gender differences maybe in indie artists versus hip hop and rap. Um, so this is more predominantly male centered. 
So that's kind of interesting. Again, this this site might be interesting for you to look at to really dive in and look at the data side of things in terms of talking about music, fandom, genres, um, issue of Spotify, and so forth. Here's a music stats website that I also included on our media page for you to look at. This goes back a little bit, I think, to 2019, but these are big statistics. And this is more like an infographic, so talking about streaming, talking about which devices people use around the world, favorite musical genres. So again, you see that genre is really a key focus for us this week. Financial stats for different kinds of music, consumer habits, and so forth. So you might also be interested in this because it really gets into that side of music becoming more of a commodity. When we get into fandom, I encourage you to look at any of these articles if you like to check out how fans are defined and what fans bring to music. That classic uh, heavy metal parking lot that we looked at a few weeks ago might also be a good thing to identify and revisit because it really suggests that fans bring so much to the performance of music and the understanding of music and even the genre itself, that we should never forget fans and their role in uh, these considerations that we're taking this week. Now let me show you that Spotify revenue or royalty estimator. So we can type in a big artist and a, a minor artist. One I might put in here, just because I heard that Roger, Roger Waters of Pink Floyd fame had has been earning like multi multi millions per year in royalties from all the performances of you know every time a Pink Floyd track is played or it gets used say in a tribute band there's a famous Pink Floyd tribute group or I think it's more of a laser show that happens here in the Tahoe Reno area so every time it gets played Roger Waters or other members of the band um, are you know getting royalties and so this is a Spotify estimator so you could see that there are 15.64 million Pink Floyd followers. They have an 82% popularity, 14.2 million monthly listeners. This estimates the monthly royalty and the yearly. So this is just off of Spotify, not all the other sites. So when you start to do the math and say, if an artist earns half a million just from this one site, how much do they earn from all the other sites? And then you get into multi-multi-millions. And this talks about how the calculator works and how you can... Um, use it. So it's kind of interesting. You can also search by genres if you want, just your 90s artists to choose a decade. And you can see Destiny's Child versus Becky G. Go back home. And then just for the for kicks, let me put me in there. And you'll see that I am 0% 0 popularity. My two Spotify uh, followers, thank you so much. I have 2.0 monthly listeners. And my yearly income from Spotify is $0.08. Cents. So that's that's pretty pretty amazing, right? So, But it just shows you how a lot of the music these days really ties in with commercialism and ties in with this idea of the streaming of the music, which gets into algorithms and marketing and, again, those big data sets and what that says about our music and its commercialization. Now, this is kind of an interesting topic and, and connects a little more to my music setup. So I have right here the Behringer clone of the ARP 2600. This is a super iconic synthesizer that you might know from uh, Star Wars. The sound of R2-D2 was made on this synth. And the company Behringer, which is a German-based company, is known for doing all these clones, and this article talks about this. So they'll take an iconic vintage synthesizer from the past and clone it. Or they're even taking current new synthesizers made by other companies like Moog Music, and then they clone it and they offer it at a lower price. So when the ARP came out here, the Behringer clone, a lot of people are shocked because they said, you can own an ARP 2000, which to buy a used is like $25,000, $30,000. And to buy the clones that were made of it, three, four, five thousand dollars. So it's pretty amazing when this came out. Now the downside of this is people are saying that Behringer is taking proprietary technology. This came up with some of the uh, Curtis chips they were using. People felt that Behringer was knocking off these very synths from the past. And as a result, you get into this issue of music technology connecting back to commercialism, connecting back to this idea of replicating or copying something maybe without having the authority or the taste, the good taste, if you will, to do this kind of thing. Now, let me just play you a sample of what this sounds like in addition just to kind of talking about 
this issue of cloning, you get a sense of what this iconic synth sounds like. And for many of us who love electronic music, uh, it's kind of a lifelong dream to own a 2600, which uh, I now do. Of course, it is a clone. So it gets back to this issue of the commercialization of music technology that we are sometimes experiencing here.
Okay, so you had a chance to hear that track. Again, I think it's interesting to consider these clones and what that says about our musical worlds. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about my fandom community or my experiences in it. Again, Bandcamp is, I think, really a site that promotes a lot of independent artists. You can go on here and hear so many different styles of music. I feel like there's no other place where you're going to hear such a wide range of styles, genres, and approaches and truly experimental stuff. And not everything on here, of course, has the most professional mix to it or quality, but that's one awesome thing about this because you feel like mistakes and grittiness and experimentalism and some of these things that we talked about in, say, week five of this class with the avant-garde's and noise music really can happen via a site that has its own collaborative approach, an approach maybe that's less focused on commercialism and more focus on community. Not that commercialism is not involved in here, but I feel like as long as artists are being paid something fair for their music and they're not having to live and die by the algorithms of Spotify or Pandora or these other sites, then there's some hope for those artists. And and for me, a lot of this really is about community. So when I look at my own YouTube site, for me, it's my primary way in which I interact with people. And I don't have necessarily a giant YouTube site. I have 2,000 followers. And my content ranges from, from different things related to my teaching videos like these, my tutorial videos for my other job at work, and then also some of my music. So what I try to do is upload the music, and I really try to take advantage of in creating these videos so it's both visual and it's also I'll just play part of this here, you can hear it. It's visual and it's also musical in nature. What I'm really interested in is would be comments or people that will offer tips or their own feedback. And this is particularly useful if I'm doing a music tutorial video. And an example that I could look up is one of my videos that has a lot of views here. I'm trying to remember offhand, this one has the most, 17,000. And this particular video I was doing really more as like a demo, trying to explain how this uh, particular piece of electronic um, instrument works. The one of the new ones. And so I'm talking here a little bit about things. On, uh, and then Kickstarter. And I think this is the one of the things that's interesting is someone said here, I love the talking. You answered every question about I had about the equipment. Um, a lot of people write sometimes comments in here where they say you're talking too much and then other people say I love the talking it's good to explain things so I find it interesting when you go to a site like YouTube and you upload your videos and if you're doing something more like a music tutorial versus a music video what people have to say this is a more recent one this is actually similar to the um, 2600 video you heard or actually, I think this is the same 2600 video you heard. And in some cases, it's just someone saying, nice stuff, thanks for posting, kind of thing. So I really enjoy these kind of videos because it's allowing me to share my music with my very small community. And it's also allowing me to get involved in some creation of music videos. And I just enjoy the video part accompanying the audio part. Because for a lot of us in electronic music communities, we're really interested in showing and telling at the same time. So if you're working with something like the 2600, as I showed you here with the sample track, you really do get into a visual presentation because you're doing all the patch points and, and minor adjustments of all the parameters on the instrument. So a little bit there about my own YouTube experiences. Again, the number one thing I enjoy about YouTube as a community for my music is the feedback that I get from people. And I love every aspect of, of the feedback and how it helps me develop as an artist, as an experimenter with music and sound. There's a ton of stuff this week, not just on fandom, but on AI music. So when we get into AI music, I really encourage you to talk about and consider the issue to which technology maybe is coming to dominate more and more of this field of music and sound production. Very specific to this, a couple sites you can look at would be Auto, um, audio.ai, which removes background noise for creators. Really amazing AI algorithms. And AI, by the way, is artificial intelligence. It's using computational power and understanding what it's listening to or hearing to take out reverb, to take out noise, to add certain presence to your voice if you're doing music tracks or vocal tracks for narrations, for podcasts. This site, Lander, 
as well as something you can look at, landr.com. They have this whole subscription-based service that really purports, I haven't tried it yet, to do perfect mixing of tracks. And they claim that because their site has mastered over 20 million tracks, it really knows every type of genre and type of music to get your tracks organized in such a way to balance the levels, the panning, and everything else that your, your music will sound perfect or great. As they say here, you create, we'll do the rest. This goes back to genre. If you have a particular genre of music that you're working with and mixing, there might be expectations of where the drum track lives relative to the bass track, relative to the, to the keys track, to the vocal tracks. And you get into all these kind of complicated issues of how the artificial intelligence then figures out the dynamics of the mix relative to genre expectations that we've been talking about this week. So. This is, I think, really the future of music, or it's maybe the now of music, because so many of us are looking at this and talking about it. Now, specific to AI music, I want to take you back to our media website and look at a few examples of these, and we'll see the ones that we can play, and hopefully you don't get a copyright strike. But these are songs here, I guess, that you can just create instantly. So let's see, we'll do a rap beat. I don't know how this works. Um, and, and here I can choose Shake Your Booty, uh, Boomy Bap, Mahogany Flex, Houseified, Icy R&B, Roulette. I guess we'll try Shake Your Booty, Create Song. And here we are going. So it's composing for us. So as we talked about earlier with VSTs and it's doing the recording, um, this is not just holding down a few loops and syncing them. We're talking about it is fully creating an AI song for us. So let's see what this sounds like. And use this opportunity, by the way, to connect this back to our earlier discussion of genre. What, From what you know about hip hop and this particular um, genre of music, does this really fit in? Now it says here, I can edit the composition. What does that involve? Um, edit the arrangement? How does that work? I'm just really curious about this. Oh, I can drag sections and rearrange them. This is way more involved than I thought. That's section seven versus section six. Sounds exactly the same. What about five? A little different. Okay, so I guess I could do this and then save my edit of it. Again, this is all I'm doing, right? I'm just clicking a few buttons and it's creating a song from scratch. Be curious to see what's happening on the back end, how this works. There's a ton of artificial intelligence-based sequencers and AI technology that you can incorporate in your computer-based music like we were talking about earlier that really suggests that you can use a lot of the AI stuff to automate and help you out with your um, your song that you're, you're trying to create. We can add a vocal. I wonder what this is like. We'll just check some of this out. I'm kind of previewing it with you here. Let's see. I can record my own voice or upload an audio. Auto vocals, I think, is what I want. Let's try auto vocals. We're recording a track for the anthropology of music and sound. We hope that this is going to be a really good track because we're demoing artificial intelligence today. Okay, I have no idea what this is going to sound like. Let's check it out. Hit continue. Of course, I didn't sing that. I was just kind of speaking it. So we'll see what it actually does with my voice. If it's going to turn it into, it says here, it will uh, magically, magically is the key word, turn any spoken audio into a complete song with vocals and lyrics. So let's see what this does. Where the end, we're recording it. Where the end, the 
And you can kind of see we're getting like little sections of song when we talk about song structure. You can definitely get into this conversation about how the algorithm, the AI, is defining the sections of these songs. We're recording a track. 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 We hope that this. We hope. We hope. We're we're the end. We're recording a. We're the end of the end. It's going to track. We could track. We could track. We could track. We could going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be. We hope that this. We hope. We hope. We're we're the end. We're recording a. We're the end of the end. It's going to track. We could track. We could track. We could track. We could going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be. We hope that this. We hope. We hope. We're we're the end. We're recording a. And the ants going to track because track because track because track because going to be going to be going to be okay we can we can pause that um i guess we can we can save it and yeah i don't know i just i feel like this is a very interesting new world of music again what i just did there i talked into it i didn't play anything. I don't need any musical talent to do this, but it's sort of showing us the future of music or the now of music in terms of the AI movement. Another example of this we can look at is what's called Sound Raw, and you can choose the mood. So again, this is going back to our discussion of theme and genre, and you select the tempo, the length of it. You could select instruments. So if I wanted all these instruments, I could hit Create Music and it is making it for me. So once again, I think AI suggests that possibly everything could be done for us with us just pressing a few buttons. This is kind of funny, it's called corporate. So let's see what that sounds like. This was made just for me. going to be curious when I put some of this up on YouTube, this video, if any of this is going to get struck, because I wonder if someone happened to, and I don't know if it literally creates every single track different, and there's no, there's total variability to avoid like censoring if someone uses that as their theme song for their business or something. But that's kind of curious too, this idea that you could create infinite variety of music such that you never repeat the same chord structures. It makes me think a little bit of that argument between David Bowie and Vanilla Ice, the um, bass track for Ice Ice Baby, which was also, which originally comes from a David Bowie song, Under Pressure. And if you hear um, uh, Vanilla Ice explaining this, he's trying to say like, well, th there's a subtle difference in the bass line. And um, kind of funny because it does kind of suggest that, you know, the issue of copyright itself and what we can claim to be our own in terms of an original idea is really hard to define. And maybe AI can help us with that a little bit if we're trying to get beyond the idea that music can be copyrighted or registered or whatever. Here are some additional examples. This is AI music. I'm just looking at these sites with you. And it looks like here, there are preset algorithms. I can also com compose with influences, no licensing headaches. Um, it looks like this, you do have to create an account with it. Okay, I can start adding tracks. Let's see, create track here. I'll choose an influence. So let's choose, how about sea shanty? I don't even know if I know that genre. Um, I can choose my own key signature, the, the pacing and time. It looks like a lot of this you have to pay for. Instrumentation, we'll do auto instrumentation. Duration, let's just do a short one. Time signature. And we'll leave everything else in auto. Let's create the track. And this is a C shanty. So if you know what a C shanty is, you could ask, will this final composition express to you what a C shanty is? So what I think we're beginning to see with the AI influences, not only does that connect us to this topic of commercialization that we're addressing here in the last few weeks and this week in particular, but we're also going back to genre because a genre is a way of defining the quality or characteristics of sound and music specific to artists and styles. And this way it's happening here with our AI compositions. Now let's see, can we play it?
And it's certainly good instrumentation, you know, really good sounding tracks there. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing here with this AI revolution is certainly super high quality. Now, the last one I'll show you is this jukebox. And uh, this one cracks me up because this was a computer program that really worked on looking at tens of thousands of various artists out there. And then you can actually look at the computer code, which is interesting, available for you. And then it used AI technology to try to recreate the sound and also vocal styles of these musicians. So this is an example of Elvis. The lyrics get kind of weird. Dusty tiny fumble scarf, but the lip hitch tells the heart. When my toe slips, when my hair is sizzling fine. At last, when he woke up to the mind. From dusty games, when you help them get the tears that get to rack. When you see the so you can ask whether that sounds like Elvis to you, whether those lyrics seem like they sound like an Elvis lyric. They're very strange lyrics if you just look at them on the screen here. But again, I think this AI revolution suggests to us that something is really changing via the technology that we're using and how that technology maybe allows us to create entire songs, compositions that fit into specific genres that we have in our heads or in our experiences with Spotify and fandom that define those parameters of sound and music that are characteristic to each genre we're talking about. And then lastly, we can talk about this interesting genre of black MIDI, which kind of doesn't connect directly to commercialization, but it more connects to the way of, of technology being used in ways that weren't possible in the past. Now, it's not the band black MIDI, it's more this compositional style. And I'm trying to see here, this is an example of Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. And what Black MIDI is, is using computer technologies to create tracks that weren't possible in the past. Literally faster than any human could play a keyboard or any instrument, as you'll see here with this example, Bohemian Rhapsody, which I don't know if it'll get struck down. We'll see, maybe not. gets cra crazier at the end. Just trying to find a crazy part that won't get struck by YouTube's algorithms. Something that's pretty recognizable. What's actually happening there, when you speed something up so quickly and you have so many notes playing, two million notes, you actually can't it's happening so fast and there's such a multitude of notes being played in such density that our brains can't pick it out. It's kind of like if you read language and I take um, letters and I take letters out of common words and then I put that all up, you can still read it because your brain fills in. In this case, we can't fill in and we can't perceive because of that speed um, happening. So Black MIDI itself, I think, is another side that's interesting that suggests to us there's a, a non-commercial side of music technology and commercialism that we're talking about today. And if you want, check out this article about the 15-year-old boy king of Black MIDI. As I always say, if you have questions, you know, reach out to me about any of the issues we talked about this week. As any questions come up as well about your projects, let me know because we're certainly at the point where we need to be thinking about finalizing the projects in this class. So that's going to be it this week for our week seven lecture. I'll be back again with another video lecture in week eight of a class next week. Good luck and I'll talk to you soon.